Hello everyone and welcome to this another episode of Book Time with Elvis with me Mark and another instalment of Short Story Saturday. Today we're going to be looking at the short story writer Catherine Beecham who you probably know better as Catherine Mansfield. So before we dive into the story itself let's have a little bit of background information uh, of Catherine's life. She was born uh, Catherine Beecham in 1888 to a well-off and prominent uh, family in Wellington, New Zealand. Because of that, of course, she was educated in elite schools. She started writing uh, during her teenage years and she wrote several popular short stories that dealt mostly with the themes of sexuality, existentialism and anxiety. When she was aged only 19, she left New Zealand and moved to England where she became good friends with Virginia Woolf and D. H. Lawrence, among others. Unfortunately, when the First World War broke out, her younger brother, Leslie Chummy Beecham, was killed, and this had a profound effect on her, and she was never quite the same. In 1917, the same year that she separated from her husband, she was diagnosed with pulmonary, pulmonary tuberculosis. And this, of course, also affected her, um, as, as you can well imagine. So she found herself scouring Europe, uh, looking for different cures and treatments regarding this, and she went to live for a while with her cousin, who was none other than Elizabeth von Arnim, uh, that celebrated author of Enchanted April, uh, in Switzerland. And of course, uh, this was where a lot of research institutes were based that would have uh, done research into her condition, uh, as well as, of course, having a better climate for her. She feared that she didn't have much time left, and so she ramped up her writing output and sadly, uh, as it happened, she died in January 1923, aged only 34. She died from uh, uh, brain hemorrhage after running up some stairs, which was, of course, uh, exacerbated or brought on by her condition. Uh, in a kind of not very nice twist at the end, her estranged husband, uh, Murray, he actually forgot to pay her funeral expenses, so she found herself laid to rest in a pauper's grave. Luckily, this was only temporary and the situation was rectified uh, and then she was moved elsewhere. Her collections of short stories include In a German Pension, Bliss and Other Stories, and The Garden Party and Other Stories. And it's from The Garden Party and Other Stories that our story today comes. So let's have a look at it. So today's short story is... Uh, Life of Ma Parker, and as I said, it comes from The Garden Party and Other Stories by Catherine Mansfield. Here we go. When the literary gentleman whose flat old Ma Parker cleaned every Tuesday opened the door to her that morning, he asked after her grandson. Ma Parker stood on the doormat inside the dark little hall and she stretched out her hand to help. To help her gentleman shut the door before she replied. We buried him yesterday, sir, she said quietly. Oh dear me! I'm sorry to hear that, said the literary gentleman in a shocked tone. He was in the middle of his breakfast. He wore a very shabby dressing gown and carried a crumpled newspaper in one hand, but he felt awkward. He could hardly go back to the warm sitting room without saying something, something more. Then because these people set such store by funerals, he said kindly, I hope the funeral went off all right. Beg pardon, sir, said my old Ma Parker huskily. Poor old bird. She did look dashed. I hope the funeral was a, a success, said he. Ma Parker gave no answer. She bent her head and hobbled off to the kitchen, clasping the old fish bag that held her cleaning things, and an apron and a pair of felt shoes. The literary gentleman raised his eyebrows and went back to his breakfast. Overcome, I suppose, he said aloud, helping himself to the marmalade. Ma Parker drew the two jetty spears out of her toque and hung it behind the door. She unhooked her worn jacket and hung that up too. Then she tied her apron and sat down to take off her boots. To take off her boots or to put them on was an agony to her, but it had been an agony for years. In fact, she was so accustomed to the pain that her face was drawn and screwed up ready for the twinge before she had so much as untied the laces. That over, she sat back with a sigh and softly rubbed her knees. Gran, Gran, her little grandson stood on her lap in his button boots. He had just come in from playing in the street. Look what a state you've made of your grand skirt into, you wicked boy. But he put his arms around her neck and rubbed his cheeks against hers. Gran, give us a penny, coaxed. 
be off with you. Gran ain't got no pennies. Yes, you have. No, I ain't. Yes, you have. Give us one. Already she was feeling for the old squashed black leather purse. Well, what'll you give your gran? He gave a shy little laugh and pressed closer. She felt his eyelid quivering against her cheek. I ain't got nothing, he murmured. The old woman sprang up, seized the iron kettle off the gas stove and took it over to the sink. The noise of the water drumming in the kettle deadened her pain, it seemed. She filled the, pa she filled the pail too, and the washing up bowl. It would take a whole book to describe the state of that kitchen. During the week, the liter literary gentleman did for himself, that is to say he emptied the tea leaves now and again into a jam jar set aside for that purpose, and if he ran out of clean forks, he wiped over one or two on the roller towel. Otherwise, as he explained to his friends, his system was quite simple, and he couldn't understand why people made all this fuss about housekeeping. You simply dirty everything you've got, get a hag in once a week to clean up, and the thing's done. The result looked like a gigantic dustbin. Even the floor was littered with toast crusts, envelopes, cigarette ends. But Ma Parker bore him no grudge. She pitied the poor young gentleman for having no one to look after him. Out of the smudgy little window you could see an immense expanse of sad-looking sky, and whenever there were clouds they looked very worn, old clouds, frayed at the edges, with holes in them, or dark stains like tea. While the water was heating, Ma Parker began sweeping the floor. Yes, she thought, as the broom knocked. What with one thing and another, I've had my share. I've had a hard life. Even the neighbours said that of her. Many a time, hobbling home with her fish bag, she heard them waiting at the corner or leaning over the area railing, saying amongst themselves, she's had a hard life, has Ma Parker. And it was so true, she wasn't in the least proud of it. It was just as if you were to say she lived in the basement back at number 27, a hard life. At sixteen, she had left Stratford and come up to London as kitchen maid. Yes, she was born in Stratford-on-Avon. Shakespeare, sir. No, people were always asking her about him, but she never heard his name until she saw it on the theatres. Nothing remained of Stratford except that, sitting in the fireplace of an evening, you could, you could see the stars through the chimney, and Mother always add her side of bacon, hanging from the ceiling. And there was something... A bush. There was at the front door that, that smelt ever so nice, but the bush was very vague. She only remembered she'd only remembered it once or twice in the hospital when she'd been taken bad. That was a dreadful place, her first place. She was never allowed out. She never went upstairs except for prayers, morning and evening. It was a fair cellar, and the cook was a cruel woman. She used to snatch away her letters from home before she'd read them before she'd read them, and throw them in the range because they made her dreamy. And the beadles, would you believe it, until she came to Lo London, she'd never seen a black beadle. Here Ma, always, here Ma always gave a little laugh, as though not to have seen a black beadle. Well, it was as if to say you'd never seen your own feet. When their family was sold up, she went as help to a doctor's house. And after two years there, on the run from morning till night, she married her husband. He was a baker. A baker, Mrs. Parker, the literary gentleman would say. For occasionally he laid aside his tomes and lent an ear, at least to this product called life. It must be rather nice to be married to a baker. Mrs. Parker didn't look so sure. Such a clean trade, said the gentleman. Mrs. Parker didn't look convinced. And didn't you like handling the new loaves to the customers? Handing the new loaves to the customers? Well, sir, said Mrs. Parker, I wasn't in the shop above a great deal. We had thirteen little ones, and buried seven of them. If it wasn't the hospital, it was the infirmary, you might say. You might indeed, Mrs. Parker, said the gentleman, shuddering and taking up his pen again. Yes, seven had gone, and while the six were still small, her husband was taken ill with consumption. It was flour on the lungs, the doctor told her at the time. Her husband sat up in bed with his shirt pulled over his head and the doctor's finger drew a circle on his back. Now, if we were to cut him open here, Mrs. Parker said the doctor, you'd find his lungs chock-a-block with white powder. Breathe, my good fellow. And Mrs. Parker never knew for certain whether she saw, or whether she fancied she saw, a great fan of white dust come out of her poor dead husband's lips. But the struggle she had had to bring up those six little children and keep us... Self to herself, terrible it had been. 
Then, just when they were old enough to go to school, her husband's sister came to stop with them to help things along, and she hadn't been there more than two months when she fell down a flight of steps and hurt her spine, and for five years Ma Parker had another baby. And such a one for crying to look after. Oh, excuse me, i sorry, I messed that up, didn't I? <laughs> and for five years Ma Parker had another baby, and such a one for crying to look after. Then young Maudie went wrong and took her sister Alice with her, the two boys emigrated, and young Jim went to India with the army, and Ethel, the youngest, married a good-for-nothing little waiter who died of ulcers the year, the year little Lenny was born, and now little Lenny, my grandson. The piles of dirty cups, dirty dishes were washed and dried. The ink-black knives were cleaned with a piece of potato and finished off with a piece of cork. The table was scrubbed and the dresser and the sink that had sardine tails swimming in it. He had never been a strong child, never from the first, He'd been one of those fair babies that everybody took for a girl. Silvery fair curls he had, blue eyes, and a little freckle like a diamond on the side of his nose. The trouble she and Ethel had had to rear that child. The things out of the newspapers they tried him with. Every Sunday morning Ethel would read aloud while Ma, Par while, while Ma, while Ma Parker did her washing. Dear sir, just a line to let you know, my little Myrtle was laid out for dead. After four bottles gained eight pounds in nine weeks and is still putting it on. And then the egg cup of ink would come off the dresser and the letter would be written, and Ma would buy a post order on her way to work the next morning. But it was no use. Nothing made little Lenny put it on. Taking him to the cemetery even never gave him colour. A nice shake-up in the bus never improved his appetite. But he was Gran's boy from the first. Whose boy are you? said old Ma Parker, straightening up from the so stove and going over to the smudgy window, and the little voice so warm, so close, it half stifled her. It seemed to be in her breast, under her heart, laughed out and said, I'm Gran's boy. At that moment there was a sound of steps, and the literary gentleman appeared, dressed for walking. Oh, Mrs Parker, I'm going out. Very good, sir. And you'll find yourself half a crown in the tray of the inkstand. Thank you, sir. Oh, by the way, Miss Parker, Mrs Parker, said the literary gentleman quickly, you didn't throw away any cocoa last time you were here, did you? No, sir. Very strange. I could have sworn I left a teaspoonful of cocoa in the tin. He broke off. He said softly and firmly, You'll always tell me when you throw things away, won't you, Mrs. Parker? And he walked off very well pleased with himself, convinced, in fact, he'd shown Mrs. Parker that under his apparent carelessness, he was as vigilant as a woman. The door banged. She took her brushes and cloths into the bedroom, but when she began to make the bed, smoothing, tucking, patting, the thought of little Lenny was unbearable. Why did he have to suffer so? That's what she couldn't understand. Why should a little angel child have to ask for his breath and fight for it? There was no sense in, make, in making a child suffer like that. From Lenny's little box of a chest there came a sound as though something was boiling. There was a great lump of something bubbling in his chest that he couldn't get rid of. When he coughed, the sweat sprang out of his head. His eyes bulged, his hands waved, and the great lump bubbled up as a potato knocks in a saucepan. But what was more awful than, than all was when he didn't cough, he sat against the pillow and never spoke or answered, or even made as if he heard, only he looked offended. It's not your poor old grand's doing it, my lovely, said old Ma Parker, patting back the damp hair from his little scarlet ears. But Lenny moved his head and edged away. Dreadfully offended with her, he looked, and solemn. He bent his head and looked at her sideways as though he couldn't have believed it of his gran. But at the last Ma Parker threw counterpane over the bed. No, she simply couldn't think about it. It was too much. She'd had too much in her life to bear. She'd borne it up till now. She'd kept herself to herself, and never once uh, had she been seen to cry, never by a living soul. Not even her own children had seen Ma break down. She'd kept a proud face always, but now, Lenny gone, what had she? She had nothing. He was all she'd got from life, and now he was took too. Why must it all have happened to me, she wondered. What have I done, said old Ma Parker, what have I done? As she said those words, she suddenly let fall her brush. She found herself in the kitchen. Her misery was so terrible that she pinned on her hat, put on her jacket, and walked out of the flat like a person in a dream. She didn't know what she was doing. She was like a person so dazed by the horror of what had happened that he walks away anywhere, as though by walking away he could escape. It was cold in the street. There was a wind like ice, people went flitting by very fast. The men walked like scissors and the women trod like cats, 
and nobody knew, nobody cared. Even if she broke down, even at last, after all these years, she were to cry, she'd find herself in the lock-up, as like as not. But at the thought of crying, it was as though little Lenny leapt from his gran's arms. Ah, that's what she wants to do, my dove. Gran wants to cry. If she could only cry now, cry for a long time over everything, beginning with her first place and the cruel cook, going on to the doctors and then the seven little ones, death of her husband, the children leaving her, and all the years of misery that led up to Lenny. But to have a proper cry over all these things would take a long time. All the same, the time for it had come. She must do it. She couldn't put it off any longer. She couldn't wait any more. Where could she go? She's had a hard life, as Ma Parker. Yes, a hard life indeed. Her chin began to tremble. There was no time to lose, but where, where? She couldn't go home. Ethel was there. It would frighten Ethel out of her life. She couldn't sit on a bench anywhere. People would come asking her questions. She couldn't possibly go back to the gentleman's flat. She had no right to cry in a stranger's house. If she sat on some steps, a policeman would speak to her. Oh, wasn't there anywhere where she could hide and keep herself to herself and stay as long as she liked, not disturbing anybody and nobody worrying her? Wasn't there anywhere in the world where she could have her cry out at last? Ma Parker stood looking up and down. The icy wind blew out her apron into a balloon and now it began to rain. There was nowhere. Whoa. So that was The Life of Ma Parker by Catherine Mansfield and I have to say it was pretty depressing stuff you know as i say, i haven't read that story before i picked one at random one that would fit into a video wouldn't take too long of course to read um and uh it's funny when i kind of skimmed through to find one i saw you know th th there was a bit of humor in it of course from the literary gentleman but that was terribly sad you know i have to say i feel sad after having read it so i apologize if it's put a dampener on your day but it's a beautiful story, and I wonder, you know, whether she's, Mansfield is, um, of course, occupied with death, given her own situation. I find it very interesting, because she puts the accent on uh, for Ma Parker, but then, uh, I don't know whether it's a typing error, but um, when she's like, she asked, it's, she's written it A-R-S-K-E-D, asked, and I wonder if that's, Mansfield's writing mistake or mistake in editing because obviously there was no need to, to use an accent there but yeah that was uh, I think quite a powerful short story um, and uh, like everyone else who looked at so far I think I need to dive deeper into uh, Catherine's, Catherine Mansfield's works uh, but yeah we'll stop there thank you very much I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you all next time do take care everyone from Elvis and I Bye-bye.